Okay, so we're going to finish up on the media operations chapter today. And another thing I want to do is take a look at another one of the prompts that uh, you could possibly work on for your final research essay. Um, and let me, uh, you know, let me just jump in. I got a bunch of pictures sort of illustrating some of the stuff that we were talking about last class and just, um, and, you know, wanted to somehow bring a little bit more of the real world into this course, uh, especially when talking about operations and things that actually go on in radio stations and television stations. Um, so I believe last class we sort of left off with the idea that for a local television station like Cron or KTVU or KGO, uh, you know, the kind of production that goes on there is mostly news and current affairs because uh, it is uh, localized content that they couldn't get from anywhere else from a, from a network. Uh, and also, because they don't split the advertising proceeds with the network, it is the most profitable time on uh, a station. So, as uh, we kind of went over when we talked ownership, you know, Cron has this, for instance, history of having lost its, you know, big three network affiliation when it lost its affiliation with NBC. Uh, they had all kinds of airtime that they had to fill. And so you'll notice that Cron has a lot of news production uh, because that is what they can do. You know, no one can set up and make House or some other kind of uh, you know Hollywood television drama at the local station level. That has to be done by networks. It costs so much money. So news and public affairs generally gets done at at a local station. So news is you know a big cost and manpower center in any local television station and uh, as we talked about you know there have been some um, some changes over the years that are impacting the kinds of jobs that are go on there but uh, one thing you still see out on the street a lot are these microwave trucks and so these are the trucks that are required to do like a remote shot, or they used to be required anyway, to do a remote shot, you know, 10 p.m. you're outside of the courthouse, or 10 a.m. you're outside of, you know, some other place where there's gonna be a press conference or something, and the trucks line up, and this microwave antenna beams the signal back to the station where it gets, you know, broadcast along with the, the rest of the news. Um, so for that, you needed, you know, qualified operators. Sometimes the, um, the, the video journalist uh, would be able to do, operate the truck as well. So you'd have kind of a camera operator trained also to set all this up and go out with a journalist, typically. You know. So uh, you may have been wondering what all those trucks were about. So, so that's what they do. Um, but uh, more and more, let's just see if we got a good image off of an ENG package here. I thought I had one. Um, well, what you can see on the back of the camera right here um, replaces that entire truck. Uh, you're going to have a battery back there, but this pack here is uh, basically a cellular uplink. So whatever gets shot on the camera, audio and video, will right away get sent over a cellular connection or actually multiple cellular connections because this is, requires a fair amount of data and also um, some redundancy in case one of the networks flutters or something and so the signal drops. You don't want to have that drop as it's going on the air. And so this kind of pack here will make several cellular data connections at the highest speeds possible and send out the live video and audio from the camera uh, that way. So this replaces like the entire truck, basically. Uh, and the, the operator, um, um, you know, doesn't really have to know all that much. Certainly not everything they would have to know in a in a microwave truck. So KTVU right now we visited last year, they still have the trucks, they have the professional, uh, you know, cinematographers or who, who work on those trucks, but they also have a lot of packages like this 
um, and they'll send you know one or the other out depending on the job. You know, if it's if it's a stand up, which is going to lead the news, they'll send out a truck because it gives people a place to sit and get prepared. And you know, it's like those reporters are kind of talents, you know, so they have somewhere to go. But if it's you know going down to Pete's Coffee because it's International Coffee Day or something and spending three hours there. So you can, you know, pad out your morning show with just people handing out coffees, which was in fact what they were doing the day that we went to KTVU. Something like this goes out because you don't mobilize the big expensive thing for such a little, you know, job basically. And if it goes down, you just cut to your morning anchors who can pad it, you know, any way they do. So, uh, so that's, uh, you know, a cost cutter. Uh, and right now we're seeing both the new and old technology kind of uh, exist together. And we also talked last class about um, switchers. So again, like the old technology, uh, again, this is just on the fly multimedia here. But as you can see, these uh, switchers will take the inputs of many studio cameras and mix between them. So you might have a camera on the news person and a camera on the weather person and stuff. And so typically it would take a human operator to, for instance, pull the bar and switch between one camera or another. Uh, and you'd have other people in the um, control room also handling audio. You'd have a director giving out cues and, uh, you know, there, there'd be five people about to do, to do a news show. But um, again, this is changing and systems like the Grass Valley Ignite system, um, you notice, wow, there's a whole lot less buttons and levers there and everything is handled digitally through macros and presets. So you're, you know, your, entire, your entire TV news run can be programmed in and just, you know, hit the buttons to move through the different events and once in a while and make an adjustment if need be. But typically all of that is you know, um, pre-programmed in. Volume levels, camera shots, all of that stuff. So this is called a switcher. The switcher switches between cameras. So this has become automated. And then the other thing we talked about was um, you know, uh, camera pedestals. Can we, uh, oh, it's probably big enough to see. So here in the studio where, you know, you have your news set, again, 20 years ago, you'd have a live camera operator for each of these cameras. But uh, in this case, as you can see, there's no live camera operator, although there's still, you know, the controls that somebody may want to take control of this if the automation goes down or something. But otherwise, you know, the this is, tethered and motorized and it drives around by itself to specific positions and the camera can pan, focus, etc. can be automated or it can be controlled from in the um, in the control room. So you know this is uh, uh, also saving saving money in the operations department of a television studio but meaning there are less kind of entry-level camera operator jobs which is typically how people, you know, even very famous um, cinematographers working on big movies and stuff, some of them began like in their local TV station at 19 years old, standing behind the camera waiting to be told what to do. And, you know, 20 years later, they're in Hollywood making movies and stuff. So uh, this is a little less what goes on, but there are still many opportunities freelance for this type of uh, television station and stuff. You won't find unionized people behind the cameras in the studio, but you, they will hire plenty of people uh, on a freelance basis to go shoot for them. So, so. There are still jobs there, but I just wanted to show you, you know, a, a special focus on news production in the television studio because that's what, um, that's what broadcasting technical jobs and you know operations in a TV studio look to lose. Let's see your basic, the basic Grass Valley setup selling for twenty-three thousand dollars, and then adding more 
in as you as you build in more more capability. Um, yeah, and as we said at KTVU, all of this was being used. You know, robotic pedestals, uh, a switcher which was all controlled by macros, and uh, those sort of lighter cellular uplink camera packages, which uh, were really cool and, and much less costly than sending out a truck. And of course, you, by streaming that content, uh, you know, there's a whole lot less space taken up, storing data, et cetera, because streaming um, takes less space than uh, transferring files around. And stuff. Okay. Um, chapter 11. So we've been through, yeah, we talked about the various departments. Um, so what department would be involved in uh, trying to get new listeners to listen to a radio station? What would that be? Do you remember? Like, you're in a radio station, you want more people to listen to you. What do you, which department of your station does that? Your ad sales reps, it's not advertising because the ad, the ad sales reps just sell the time on your station. So what, what other part of a radio station would be involved in getting new listeners to your radio station? We have no answers? Ding, ding, ding. Okay, well, the answer is promotions. Promotions are involved in, you know, uh, trying to put billboard ads up on a bus or something like that, which would um, get new listeners aware of the station. Just wondering if I'm getting good answers in chat and I'm not paying any. Hey, Katerina answers promotion. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she got it for sure. That's cool. Love chat. <laughs> when it's a tough morning, there's always chat. Let's hope so. All right. Well, that's good. Yep. Promotions is definitely the answer there. Um, oops. More coming in over chat. Good morning, Isabella. All right, so uh, yes, talking about promotions, and you know, typically when you're working in promotions for a television station or a uh, radio station, you want to get attention while not being too controversial. So uh, that means you know you'll be doing sort of good types of community relations promotions. Uh, you know, community events, publicized programs and personalities. So you'll be asking your anchor people or your radio DJs to, you know, go to like a blood drive or to, you know, some kind of benefit activities. And, and people who are on-air personalities do a lot of that, actually. Uh, it's viewed as part of the job. It's to, you know, promote the station uh, just by your very presence if you are known camera and stuff. Um, so yeah, and they'll be very selective about promotions, especially in a television station uh, where, you know, they're really going to be looking for, um, you know, uh, promotions that enhance their brand, either, either because they're, you know, kind of slick galas with big money people there or, um, you know, really good stuff that's, you know, helping the community do better. So at, in, in radio, you'll find, you know, hey, come on down. We're, uh, you know, at Mattress Center this week and uh, we'll be giving away, uh, you know, uh, free junk from the station five days a week or something like that. So radio, again, tends to be a little bit more modest in, in uh, the types of events that they promote. But, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, and let's see now, um, looking into the cable business and what goes on in cable. I mean, we've all, uh, well, we've all seen the trucks the, for Comcast going around town. And if you live in another community, it may be a, a different provider. 
but uh, uh, you know that, that is uh, uh, wiring up homes and maintaining the wiring uh, is a big part of the cable operations business. Um, as people are taking less and less channels, more and more people are taking internet through uh, cable. So um, the cable system uh, has requires a lot of manpower to basically organize and maintain, you know, the uh, the physical infrastructure, which is shaped kind of like a tree with branches, you know. So, as um, they've got what's called the head end, which is largely automated now, but this is where, for instance, uh, all the signals come in by satellite. Yeah. So you thought cable didn't was a competitor to satellite? Well. It is uh, a competitor to the uh, uh, direct-to-consumer small satellites, but everything is basically being by satellite to the cable head end. And then the cable, so this is cable operations. Then the cable signal is distributed out through their amplifiers at various points. And sooner or later, these branch out into, you know, local connection so you know looks like a tree tipped on the side basically uh, with you know more and more this trunk is going to be fiber optic it's going to be very fast uh, but sooner or later as you get to the home the uh, cable is still um, you know kind of slowed down because it runs through coaxial cable now, which is pretty fast, but it's not as fast as a digital fiber optic connection, which is just light pulses, right? So sooner or later, all of that is going to get changed out into uh, fiber optics, which can run a hundred times faster than the um, cable connections. And right now, there are some services in San Francisco which use fiber optic. And I think Comcast is trying to catch up on too. So, hey Max, we'll be seeing we'll be seeing you know developments there. But cable operations, then you know, there's a lot of people driving around in trucks, uh, handling you know the individual connections into people's homes and troubleshooting those. And that's where so you know signal tends to slow down stuff. Um, now cable cable systems have multiple systems in different play, uh, parts of you know. Basically, if Comcast is set up in San Francisco, they'll also be, uh, 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 you know, handling communities down the peninsula. Um, cable is such a heavy infrastructure that you don't have two competing cable systems in any market area. Uh, the local government will make a deal, let's say, with Comcast or with one of the other providers, and usually it lasts for multiple years, like five years or 10 years. And at that time, uh, the cable operator has basically a, a monopoly within that market. Uh, of course, they compete against AT&T, who has their television bundle that they deliver over phone lines, or you know, Sonic, which has their uh, fiber connection. And you know, so, so they do compete with other systems, but like cable in each of its uh, markets will be a, a monopoly um, and th the deal changes every few years. You know. um, so some of the challenges that cable faces is they've got to uh, provide the bundles which keep people subscribing for basic cable and for the various tiers and stuff and as you can see HBO, ESPN, as we heard in the industry news there's more and more of a tendency of uh, those premium goodies uh, to split off and become streaming services. So a lot of people are, you remember the word for people who are no longer subscribing to cable, what they're called? Cable requires a cord, right? So what do we call the people who are not subscribing to cable anymore? Cordless. Cord cutters, cord actually. Cutters. Cord cutters, yeah. Schnip. So more and more people are not subscribing for the television. Maybe they're getting their internet that way. So that is, you know, a new challenge. 
Um, so Comcast itself, cable operators, they don't produce those shows that are done, you know, like Breaking Bad or something like that. Those are produced by independent studios, which tend to own those shows. Um, some broadcasters like AMC, for instance, with Walking Dead, they actually, uh, you know, own and produce that property. Many of your, you know, channels like Showtime or whatever will maybe co-produce, but they don't outright own it. But a Comcast, you know, a cable company that handles all of this, they can sell commercials on this. So you'll see some very um, uh, low production value local commercials that will go out that are actually produced by the local cable operator. They get to drop their commercials in uh, when they are, uh, you know, airing shows on cable only channels. So that's um, that's something that they produce. That's that's work in there. Uh, so they have sales associates uh, who you know compete with network TV and everybody else. Uh, their promotions are pretty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> notorious for you never know how much the cable is actually worth because they keep on offering you know a bundle of three services at once and the price will go up six months later and it's all it's one of the things that makes cable one of the most detested parts of the broadcasting business because the price just seems to go up and you never know where you are so I wouldn't say that's a real success promotions uh, in, in the cable business. Um, let's just see. Um, yes, some large market MSOs have a local news channel. Uh, so, you know, since Comcast bought NBC, so they're now Comcast NBC Universal, this is a few years back, um, they clearly have, you know, uh, the NBC sports channels NBC branded sports channels and such, which are cable only channels, but they, um, they uh, are a Comcast property, basically. So that's another part of their business. Um, yeah, I think that's mostly what you would see with, um, with the way that the cable business is operated, I think, operation. All right, well, before we get into satellite radio and such, ooh, um, let's change gears just for a quick dip into our possible topics for your final term paper. So last class, we, uh, let's just see if anybody in chat has, Told us something interesting. Promotion. <laughs> I love that. Just refresh and see. Sometimes these things don't get in here. Okay. Well, it seems like the last we heard from was Isabella. Righto. So you know that last day of classes or thereabouts, uh, a second four-page research paper is due. Let's get you the exact due date on this. December six, actually. So it's coming up. Um. So December 6th, and there are various topics. Last class, we talked about a very interesting topic, which is to create a biography of a local radio station. So by going on Wikipedia, you could find out just about any local radio station, its history. And uh, I'm asking you to track ownership and format changes because those are really key developments. And uh, I think you'll see with most of our local stations, ownership, changes around the year 2000, between 96 and 2000, which will make a big difference to the station. So uh, that would be a very interesting one. So let's look at an, a couple now, because it's coming up on us, another couple. So let's look at the second one here. XM and Sirius Radio are competitors for the terrestrial radio audience. By that we mean they compete with FM and AM radio as well. As they, coexist in your car, discuss the successes and failures of satellite radio, using such discussion points as the business model, subscription fatigue, and high profile personalities that may or may not attract the audience the services require. 
So, um, do you know of any high profile personalities that are on satellite radio? Howard Stern. Howard Stern, that's a great one, yeah. So, that would be in, in, over here. So, that sounds serious. Yeah. So, Howard Stern, right? Uh, sort of uh, came up on original terrestrial radio before satellite existed, had a huge audience, but also was constantly being fined by the FCC for content um, infractions. And so, <laughs> thanks Katarina. So I, I believe that, that shows us there's probably like a minute delay or so between the time that someone's streaming answers and we actually, it shows up in class. But absolutely right. Howard Stern is a great example. So he eventually went over to XM Sirius um, uh, because of, uh, you know, his original employers were getting fined all the time as he, you know, the kind of content that his audience wanted to listen to would get him fined on regular terrestrial radio. So uh, you could look up how much his salary is. I think it's pretty gigantic. Um, and also you could look up at XM and Sirius, right? Which, uh, first of all, began as two separate services, but they had to fuse because there weren't enough subscribers to actually support two comp competing services. So originally Congress and the FCC, you know, they don't like a monopoly, right? We all know, I mean, we know that we know, <laughs> we know the board game <laughs> monopoly, but mono meaning one means that there is one owner who dominates in a marketplace. And, uh, you know, so we do have a situation in which XM Sirius is the monopoly provider of satellite radio now. Uh, uh, Congress wanted to have two separate services to compete, but instead we only got one because that's uh, the only thing that subscription could actually support. So that you know would be something that you could discuss under this notion of subscription fatigue you know, first of all, you got to convince people that, hey, this is worthwhile enough that I'm going to pay a monthly fee instead of just get free radio, number one. Uh, number two, you've got to keep them happy enough so that they're not just going to let the subscription lapse. So if you buy a new vehicle or if you rent a vehicle, you'll get free satellite radio for a while and they'll get you used to it and then hope you'll keep on paying for it. But if you don't, then subscription fatigue sets in, you know, which is you start to say, ah, I'm paying Netflix. I'm thinking about, you know, subscribing to uh, the San Francisco Chronicle and blah, blah, blah. I'm finally winding up paying $40 of streaming services uh, do I really need XM Sirius as well, or would I rather just have you know, a competing digital service too? So uh, when, when answering this part of it, I think you could point out how um, hard a sell it is to get one more subscription service, especially when you can get free radio. And uh, then also, um, Think of the other competitors that are also providing something similar. So you just want to talk about that. Uh, yeah, and then uh, to discuss the successes and failures of satellite radio, well, again, if you look up XM Sirius in our textbook, there'll be a little bit. On Wikipedia, there will be a lot just about, you know, when the service started and when the idea that really we couldn't sustain two separate services became a reality of the two merging. And you may even want to bring up what came up in industry news presentations as well, that Pandora was recently bought by XM Sirius, uh, which is looking for, uh, you know, well, how would you interpret that? Why would they want to buy a Pandora? Can 
the idea. The internet radio company. Pardon me? Keep up with the competition between the internet radio company. Absolutely. Were you thinking that too, man? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. You know, if if you see yourself as, you know, competing with Apple Music, with Spotify, with Pandora, um, maybe you're going to buy the one that's the cheapest of that type of service, which has nonetheless a brand and subscribers. Uh, and so, you know, you can kind of expand into that area. And, you know, and there's good, I guess they would call it synergy. You know, there's good uh, compatibility between being, a, you know, basically what is like a multi-channel audio provider through the satellite radio in your car and then also, you know, a limitless channel provider digitally as well. So, you know, and, and you can probably improve your fortunes that way. So, so that's what I would do uh, um, if I was working on this one. Basically, I go to the textbook, read up on XM Sirius, go to Wikipedia and get more detail. They'll have way more than the textbook. And then just, you know, basically think it through, you know. Uh, what's so difficult about getting people to subscribe? Why would they want to not subscribe? What are the competitors? What are their other options as consumers? And then also, you know, uh, what kind of, you know, extremely costly uh, per personalities do you have to have in order to make XM Sirius work? compared to Spotify or Apple Music, which pays nobody anything, you know, just fractional money to, for music. Right? So, um, it'll give you a good sense, competitive. So Chow, we're gonna talk about that later on? Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, hopefully that gave you some ideas. All right, and I said we should do two, so I know this is really thrilling. Um, let's take a look at, uh, I mean, is there one that's, well, you know what? Before we jump into another one, um, let's just go back here. And we talked about cable services, but looking at satellite radio operation, you know, what kind of jobs are in there? Management, engineering, production, programming, sales, and promotion. So it's very much like a large local radio station. Um, except what you are providing is, you know, literally dozens of channels instead of just one channel if you're a local radio station. So, uh, and of course there'd be studios in Los Angeles, studios in the East Coast as well, that are, uh, you know, actually doing the production and then coming online at different times. So that doesn't tell us too much more about, you know, for, for that particular prompt, but there it is. Uh, yeah. Satellite delivery. Yeah, we come back to that distinction between, you know, uh, sort of a podcast where you're shipping out files of uh, media content that gets downloaded to your device versus streaming. And so, you know, satellite radio, satellite systems behave quite a bit just like over the top channels that uh, are streamed to you at home. You know, for all of them, you don't come away with a DVD or a digital file that you can hang on to and, uh, you know, resell or just put in the garage or something. <laughs> it's just like, you know, the real trend is towards streaming. You subscribe as a, as a user, you subscribe and you get content streamed to you and you never actually own it anymore. You just own the right to stream it. And that comes and goes. You guys see any downside with uh, this trend towards streaming rather than outright selling you stuff? It certainly takes less storage. I mean, you don't wind up with gigabytes and gigabytes of files. That you have to worry, hey, I paid 10 bucks for this movie and now it's being wiped. But any disadvantages of that? Disadvantages of streaming. Of streaming, yeah. Like, let's say that 
The only way you could access the history of movies would be to join a streaming service and hope that they had those movies available. Let's say if you're a movie buff. Did you see a downside to that versus you possibly have to subscribe to three or four different streaming services to yeah. get the movies you want. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And maybe some movies that you want to see are just not available. So you need to buy them anyway. Yeah. If, and hopefully they're, they're available like that. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. I think that's a real good point. You're kind of at the mercy of the licensing, uh, you know, parts of these businesses as to... And there's, there's going to be a huge change when Disney withdraws all of its stuff from Netflix. And when, you know, uh, anything produced by Fox will also be withdrawn, House, all those shows, uh, because Disney bought 21st Century Fox or 20th Century Fox. So, so Netflix will, you know, within a year or two, probably uh, be, you know, mostly flying with its self-produced content, which is very impressive. And they've been, you know, pouring money into it to, in, in preparation for this huge shift. But this is, this is going to happen. So, you know, your Netflix account will not get you all that it gets you this year, next year, it'll change. So, so yeah, you, 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 for the convenience of not storing a lot of stuff, you lose Some, some forms of access, anyway, yeah. Okay, uh, so yeah, we were gonna go back to just looking um, at a prompt. Well, let's, let's do the first one as well. So this one is another option, right? Prepare an advertising profile of three different television programs from three different genres and stations. For example, profile how to get away with murder on ABC, The O'Reilly Factor on Fox News, and NCIS on CBS. Um, discuss the trends you see in the type of advertising presented and what it says about the target audience for each program. Um, as discussed in class, pick three programs of different types and discuss only a couple of ads from each program that give you specific clues about the target audience. Okay, so. Um, I put that last sentence in last just to, to emphasize that, um, you know, this is not an exhaustive topic here. It's rather something where you are basically looking at a TV show, you know, one, two, three, and you're asking, uh, well, first you just watch it and say, what are the ads that I'm seeing on each yeah. of these? And then you're saying, based on the ads, kind of like we did in our little advertising exercise here in class, who's the audience that these ads seem to be targeting? So, and this works best when you pick three very different type of shows, like in my example up here. So if you look at this, maybe How to Get Away with Murder and NCIS are not all that different in terms of target audience, but definitely the O'Reilly factor goes after a very different audience, right? And so the idea is to look at the ads and you might be able to guess like the age of the audience, uh, the political, Persuasion, you know, conservative, liberal, etc. Um, it might be gender. You know, you could make the argument that maybe How to Get Away with Murder is a show which goes after slightly more of a female audience than NCIS, although that would be a big assumption. But we're making guesses here. And as long as you can support your guests with some logic, that's okay. I wouldn't want to say that, you know, guessing actually gives us the kind of knowledge that the networks have. They know exactly who they're targeting. 
But, you know, you might also look the show up on Wikipedia and see if it does talk about the target audience and stuff. Sometimes um, entire genres of shows exist on network TV because they appeal to a particular audience. You know? So if what kind of programming do you think would reach middle-aged men? I'm going to have to go with uh, The Blacklist with James Spader in it. Oh, okay. That's an interesting one. Okay. I don't know the show, but when you tell me James Spader, I'm thinking, you know, of a breakout actor of the 1980s and, you know, like with a particular persona, mm -hmm. so would be recognizable, identifiable to that group. Okay. That's a good one. And in terms of an entire genre of programming, and it does, this doesn't have to all be like entertainment programming either, or <laughs> political entertainment. But okay, let me propose sports, okay? So you could take a look at a football game, which is always the number one rating show on any network, and ask, you know, well, what kind of ads are on sports? You know, for cars, they'll be for hardware maybe, They'll be for, you know. Shaving products. Yeah, exactly, you know, so on and so forth. So yeah, so what would be male personal care or something like that, all right? So you only have to give me a couple of examples which would say, well, you know, if it's shaving products, they're certainly going after men who are old enough to shave, you know, and so that would be it. So this is the most fun or diverse if you pick programming which is, you know, quite different in its approach and stuff. So there you go. If you have cable at home, so you have access to a wide variety of shows, I say this could be a really fun one to do. So, you know, first thing to do, pick three very different shows. Next thing to do, look at the ads, note down a couple of standout ads, which to you seem to really give you a clue about the target audience, and then go ahead, write it up. You know, introduction, I looked at these three shows. Uh, you know, the next paragraphs. When I looked at, you know, Monday Night Football, uh, which I looked at on December 1st or whatever, I saw this ad and this ad. You know, and this ad had uh, a well-known celebrity shaving or something like that. Then that leads me to believe that the target audience was men of a certain age. And boom, you do that for one, two, three shows, and you're done. So any questions about that one? If you're into TV, I think that could be a fun one to do. And you know, it's. It's based on good description and analysis. Again, you know, there might be a little bit in the textbook about this, but this is mostly watching yourself, thinking about what you've seen, and Wikipedia could help, for instance, maybe give you a couple more clues about, you know, some shows, and you know, did they talk about who their target audience is? Give you some more clues, and that's certainly relevant. Okay, cool. So, you know, now we've got three on the table and next class uh, we'll, you know, discuss the last one. Uh, so that's due December 6th, four pages. Um, as you know, the requirements and guidelines are here. Um, I had some excellent ones last time. Please, you know, left justify your text, but otherwise there were some really good ones. But there were also people who hung back last time, and that would not be a good strategy. Make sure you get something in to get credit. And, uh, you know, this is, um, it can be uh, uh, not too intimidating a thing if, uh, if you think it through patiently. Just take it one step at a time, and I am always available Tuesday, Thursday, 11 till 12 in my office hour, or you can talk to me after class, too, if you need some advice or such. Good morning, Desiree. Let's just see if that was my...
Yeah. Okay. Cool. All righty. Let's see. I think we may uh, finish in time to have a little kahoot today, which would be less boring than hearing me talk constantly. So let's see here. Sure. Exactly what else we got to get through before that would be a useful thing to do. Remember, we've been talking about operations, which is, you know, uh, last week we, you know, and the week before, because last week was largely canceled. It was completely canceled. So the week before, we talked about ownership um, and the various trends that are happening in the business. When we talk about operations, we're talking more, you know, at the ground level, locally, what goes on in these different types of businesses. Right? Um, so looking at, you know, the impact of the internet and again, this was a consistent theme through our industry use presentations. Um, this trend towards streaming, which is taking away from cable, which is giving us these over the top services, which appear on our television, uh, equally competing with broadcast as well as cable, uh, so all kinds of new direct-to-consumer options. And I think what we're, everyone is anticipating and everyone's kind of wondering, you know, how quickly will cable subscription decline? Uh, when will we feel the saturation point where people say, I save 60 bucks a month by cutting the cord to cable? I'm now spending 60 bucks a month with my Amazon Prime and my Netflix and my, you know, HBO Go and my Disney whatever and my CBS whatever and so I'm through. You know, so they're going to test out that. And I think we got to anticipate Amazon doing what it already does, which is, you know, basically, I don't know what you feel about Prime, but there's never anything I really want to watch on Prime. In fact, you have to rent something from them. And then they also will sell you HBO through Amazon if you want. So somebody's going to bundle these together. And very, you know, eventually in the next five years, it's going to start to look like cable TV all over again as you, you know, get the Amazon basic bundle or something like that or the, the Hulu with live television incorporated into the Hulu library or who knows what happened to Hulu. I don't think it'll be around five years from now. But I think we can guarantee that Netflix will in a very different form and Amazon may well rule the world by then. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, so that's a, that's a big thing. Um, we talked about some of the downsides maybe of uh, streaming. Um, so, yeah, let's see what else we got here. I mean, um, another, another potential as well, which Hulu exploits but Netflix doesn't, is you can now sell advertising through your streaming service just as well. So, you know, it's all going to converge. Right, oh, what's the future look like? A future for terrestrial radio does not look like growth. Uh, it's, it's widely distributed and available, but people don't invest too much in it. And um, the audience is being picked off, and the audience is getting older. And older people are less valuable than young people to advertisers. So it doesn't look great, whereas online radio seems to uh, you know, have very low cost and uh, wide distribution growing. So that's a growth area. Um, Production styles for regular radio, it's mostly talk now, right? Yep. Nice. Does radio hold any sort of licensing or rights that a streaming service does not have access to? Oh, that's a good point. I don't see that as a huge value, except that the streaming services have trouble localizing in the way that terrestrial radio does. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, just wondering how, you know, I mean, I guess you could, you know, you could 
set up a streaming service or a channel, like a channel, like Voice of the Bay or something like that. And then you could program that channel to be really, really local, and it, but it would be like one of hundreds which would be available. Yeah. So I guess you could reproduce something like that mm -hmm. without, you know. And I guess the other thing is we mustn't forget about the percentage of the population that can't afford those services, yeah. right? You know? Uh, there will be a digital divide, and so terrestrial radio is still going to be important. But they're, again, you know, they don't have the same amount of money, and so advertising may not be the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a good question. Off the top of my head, I don't really see the, you know, the huge value in a license anymore. But, yeah. Um, automation, consolidation, mergers, right? So we saw that... Uh, like, for instance, an iHeartRadio with literally thousands of stations can combine management. We have seven iHeartRadio stations in the Bay Area. They're all under one roof with one engineer. They'll have separate sales departments because that's where the value comes from. But in terms of running the station, all, all, you know, all the employees will be working for several stations at once. And then if you go to smaller markets, uh, the entire thing can be robotically controlled from elsewhere. And so, you know, literally they'll install a console which just feeds through a signal which comes from somewhere else. Uh, FCC requires that there be a live person in a stu station all the time, but it may be a minimum wage worker who's just there to answer the phone in case there's an emergency or something. So uh, that also takes away the value of a radio station. It's like basically, it's just a repeater from somewhere else. Television stations, yeah, every part of this business is under financial pressure. Um, you know, even Facebook and Google are now under financial pressure. In the last few weeks, their stocks, as you know, Facebook, I think, has lost 20% of its value or something through scandal and such. It's pretty incredible. Um, all of those tech stocks are down right now. Um, again, uh, you know, a lot has to do with predictions of growth about where the business could go. And so, uh, you know, um, when you find out that 60% of the country already has Amazon Prime, which is an unbelievable fact that I heard recently, uh, that makes you think that, okay, where can Amazon grow? It's going to have to grow outside of this country. And as you, you know, we mentioned that Comcast just bought you know, a foreign satellite distribution service for billions of dollars. And uh, Netflix obviously has in its DNA a global footprint. So uh, a lot of these are looking for growth outside of this country, which is pretty wild. Um, yeah, so TV, again, local TV stations with their local news audience are still profitable for sure. But again, you don't see the growth there that you used to. Uh, and network audiences have been declining for a long time. So there are all those trends there, which I could just read them off the slide, but what the heck, right? <laughs> Satellite radio, as we saw, yeah, I mean, all of this. Let's do a Kahoot, because... Uh, I think we hit everything that's really very important there. So. Give ourselves time to bumble around and open up a Kahoot. That's a kind of me operating. Here we go. So I do hope some folks will be interested enough to play. It's always fun. Chapter 11, that's what we've been on. Let's play one. Classic. Just see how this looks too. It. We got a problem with Wi Fi. Wi Fi is not working for us. 
Anybody else? Uncle Max got in. How's it going, Chow? Managing? Oh, excellent. Great. I'll let you get in and we'll start. Michael, are you going to play? We have the music. start we're here Chow jumped in it's 800 uh, yeah you can't see it on there huh it is at the bottom of the screen 800 for those who'd like to play streaming content to your computer takes less file than downloading it true or false all right we all got that one right so yeah, that is part of the attraction uh, to the consumer of all of these streaming services rather than actually having to store content. Newsrooms using new technologies typically increase the size of their field production crews. Would that be true or false? Okay, false. So as we saw with robotic pedestals which drive around so you don't need any camera operators or you know uh, 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 putting a, a, pack, a cellular pack on the back of a camera so that you don't need someone to drive a satellite truck or run that and you know even a switcher back at the studio which all runs off of a computer instead of having five people so for all of those the you know the production serve crews have gotten smaller in some cases eliminated altogether by technology so even though you have to pay $25,000 for that computer controlled thing it's cheap studio cameras are mounted on what what do they call those things Was it pedestals, was it tripods, was it gaffers, or camera controllers? Right, so the official name is pedestal, like putting somebody on a pedestal. So that's the official name for the studio. The computerized device combines and processes signals from multiple video sources. So you'll have one of these in the television studio, which combines the signals from all the cameras, and from the pre-recorded video and from the live shot, all of that runs through this device, which, yes, everyone got it. Four out of four, it's called a switcher, right? It switches between the different signals. That's excellent, great. And radio promotions are designed to generate controversy so people will talk about the station, true or false. If you're running a station, do you want something controversial, getting people talking about it? All right, we got an even split. So in the era of Trump, you know, controversy <laughs> seems like a good thing. But to private business, controversy is not a good thing. What you want to do is avoid controversial promotions. So you just want to do stuff that looks good to the community. Um, so that people think well of your station and of your personalities. You don't want conflict. One advantage that terrestrial radio continues to have over satellite and streaming is localism. Is that true or false? Oh, we had an even split there, but the correct answer is true. Okay, so uh, terrestrial radio, which is FM and AM, has this advantage of localism 
that when you are streaming from Pandora or listening to a national broadcast XM Sirius, you don't get your local flavor or news. And question seven, who's in charge of policy, hiring, payroll, contracts, and facilities at a local station? So somebody there has that job. Is it the program director? Is it the production department? Is it general management? Or is it engineering? Which would it be? Let's see. All right. Well, we got a, we got a predominance of the right answer, general management. So the general management takes care of all of that. Notice they're not involved so much with the content as they are of you know, staffing and operating a business, just like they would with any other business. Which of the following works most closely with the music director? So here we're talking about radio stations, and is it a regional sales manager who works with the music director, or the chief engineer, or the promotions director, or the program director? Which of those positions works most closely with the music director, choosing what music goes out on the air. All right, well, again, we got two with the right answer. So the program director is in charge of everything that you hear on the radio station. That's called programming. So that would mean that the program director hires the music director, they hire the news director, they hire the DJs, they hire the news announcers. They are also responsible for the commercials that are sold by the ad people. So anything that is content that you hear, that's programming. And so the music director definitely works with the program director versus all of these other positions are more about you know maintaining the station or selling or going after an audience, but it's not so much about the content that we hear. So program director and music director work closely together. The engineering department of a local station is also responsible for FCC technical compliance. Is that true or is that false? Hey, unanimity, right? Technical compliance means that to get your FCC license, you have to broadcast at a certain power, on a certain frequency, with all kinds of technical uh, um, stuff you have to meet. So the engineer, that's a big part of the engineer's job is to make sure they're compliant. The system for distributing cable TV to subscribers resembles a tree with trunk and branches. Is that true or false? A unanimity again, that's fantastic. So that is true. Um, it does look like a tree tipped on its side. There's the trunk is typically fiber optic and then the branches switch down to um, a slower medium right now, but eventually it will all be digital and fiber optic. The type of wires used by cable systems do not lose strength when traveling long distances. Ooh, okay, this is a new one that specific so it says they do not lose strength do you think that sounds reasonable just guess okay three people got it right so in fact they do lose strength uh, there are limitations on the speed that a cable provider can give you because the further you get from one of these branching points uh, the slower the signal becomes it's not a problem in uh, optical, fiber optic systems. It's another great thing about them. Buying time on other media to publicize a broadcast station involves which department? So at a local station, you want to go out and get people who know, don't know anything about you. You want them to listen to your station. So what would that be? And good, we got at least a majority got it right. That would be promotions, you know? So uh, promotions are putting up billboards, putting up advertisements on buses, basically saying, okay, listen to us. 
Okay, TV programming departments are primarily concerned with what do they do in a TV programming department? Do they hire staff? Do they produce programming? Do they acquire and schedule programming? Or do they do content censorship? So remember we're talking about primarily concerned. What do they mostly do at your local TV station in the programming department? Okay, well, nobody got it right. All right, so let's clarify this one, right? Uh, what was the most popular I, was program production. Well, that would typically be the production department that deals with that. So, you know, they are going to be responsible for coordinating and paying for, for instance, the news crews that go out and do any of the production. If you're in programming on a television station, most of your time is spent acquiring and scheduling shows. So because most of the time on a local TV station is not produced locally, it comes from different sources. So, um, you know, Cron is a pretty extreme example because they don't have a very strong network affiliation. They do have, you know, something called My Network, which is a, a, a minor product owned by Fox. Uh, which basically gives them some, you know, not very popular programs during prime time. But Cron does more local production than your typical TV stations. So programming is looking at acquiring, in other words, buying programs and scheduling. Like, when do we actually put those on? Boom. Let's move on. This is our last question. In larger markets, the sales manager position may be divided into local sales manager and what? Local sales manager and promotions director, local sales manager and general sales, general manager, or local sales manager and regional or national sales manager, or a collections agency, which I can guarantee is not the answer. All right, we did well. We're back to majority. Regional or national sales manager. So this is the idea that in larger market, uh, you're not just going to be selling to local mom and pop stores. You're also going to be getting calls from media buyers in New York or Los Angeles and say, yeah, we want to do a national campaign and, you know, we would like to buy uh, two hours of spots over the next few months on your station. So that would be, you know, a national sales manager who would also, that would only be their job, is to sit there and answer those calls and make those sales, which is very different than the local manager, which goes out to local businesses. Well, there we go. Thank you for your attention. Um, I wish you a good weekend. We'll be back next week with a much more interesting topic, which is what we know about social and psychological impacts of television. So hopefully we'll be more inspired next week. All of us, believe me. <laughs> so have a good weekend, guys.